Hi everyone, Dan Gunner here from Insane Forensics. Welcome to Tech Talk Tuesday. Today we're going to talk about a more advanced tactic and how to hunt it. We're going to talk about steganography, um, which is basically hiding information in plain sight. Um, the MITRE technique on this is T1027003. Um, and let's get started. So let's start out with what steganography is. So we included here the description from the MITRE attack page. But steganography is basically hiding data and other data. Um, and there's at least two different types. There's storage base and timing base. Today, we're going to talk about how a few different APT groups were using storage base. So they were doing it in images. Um, this is where you either use a part of the image or some other feature of um, whatever medium you're using to hold it. Um, where timing base can use basically a signaling channel. So if you think about it, you might load a resource um, to indicate a one, you might load another to have a zero and have a clock. So you kind of have a binary transfer going on between there. But today, like I said, we're going to talk about storage base. So let's start out and say why it matters. I mean, is this something that's theoretical? Um, and it's not, I mean, it's actually been previously used by quite a few different APT groups. Some of the major ones like APT 29, and Leviathan, which is APT 34, um, Muddy Water, which um, some news stories have come out um, about recently. I know they've been in the news recently, um, but also multiple Dukes tools. So if you go through the history of the Dukes tool set, um, some of which turned into APT 29's tool set, you've seen use of uh, steganography throughout all of this. Um, it can be challenging to detect. And this can be, be, be because um, it might be computationally expensive for traditional network monitoring to do it. So it just, it doesn't have the resources to do it or it just might not be entirely detectable. I mean, if you're hiding images and pictures and you're sending it over a SSL and you're not intercepting, if you can or aren't intercepting SSL, um, you're not going to see it. And for this reason, when you get to number three, a lot of firewall rules might allow this type of traffic through. So it's not something to where you can easily set um, a port-based firewall or even some application level firewalls, again, for that computational reason, aren't going to go as deep. So that's why it matters. Let's talk a little bit about how it works. And so in this case, we're going to talk about what's called least significant bit steganography. Um, the simple way to break this down is to think of it as a picture. So you have a bitmap. And in that picture, there's all of the individual pixels and each of those pixels had a red, green and blue value. At the top, we might have that color orange, which is you know, the hex value F36E3A. Well, what the Duke's malware did, what the APT29 malware did was it took the last two bits of that red, it took the last three bits of the green and the last three bits of the blue um, and made those changes throughout the image. So if you think across the image, the amount of data you can store is roughly equal to the number of pixels you have in there. Um, as you can see here, the oranges look very similar. And so even depending on the number of bits you use, um, you know, you can hide more and more data and it might not be immediately obvious. Um, this again is a very high level of how least significant bit steganography is used but with this, if you control both the sending side and the receiving side, you know, it's very hard to see this actually in motion. More resources, if you do wanna go deeper, um, there's a really good paper out there by ESET and we'll drop the link in called Operation Ghost. Um, the Dukes aren't back, they never left. Um, this is a slightly older, it's a few year old paper, but they go really well into depth on how the malware used steganography. Um, have to give a shout out also to a presentation Solomon and I did, Solomon, Sonia and I did in 2012 at ChmooCon. Um, this was actually my first conference presentation. We actually implemented steganography and used, uh, um, hid the, you know, yeah, hid the data in images, put those images up on Imgur, and then uh, pushed um, those links to those Imgur, used social media to spread it around. And so again, whether it be kind of the theoretical attack here, or if you look into the ESAP paper and how it was used, I mean, the attackers have used Dropbox, they've used social media sites, they've used really anywhere that you expect pictures, um, you know, people could 
kind of hide in that noise of what traffic is. I think when we were using Emger and when we were looking at Facebook, um, you know, those sites sometimes, or those sites do get millions of pictures a day. So there's a lot of space to hide in when you look at that there, but definitely check out these two resources if you want to know more. So quick tips, we're going to keep this short, um, but quick tips against defending against steganography. At the network level, so I said TLS can be a challenge to it, but at the network level, you might look for anomalies on image resource usage. Hey, if I'm requesting the same image um, from the website, how often does that image change? Because honestly, if it's a um, picture on a website, if it's like the logo or something, how often should that change? That network anomaly might lead you to say, hey, well, what's going on with that image? Is there something on the server side that's actually using that image um, and using that image load to pass data. Um, defending against it, there's always that common practice of segmenting the network, understanding what sites shouldn't be on certain portions maybe of your network um, and understanding user profiles. So when you get into attacks like this where it's blended in, understanding what resources your um, users are using, when they use them, and really the context of why can help you maybe find hey, it's really weird for a user to be um, you know, accessing these sites or these images. Um, again, from the network side, it can be hard because especially as your network grows, they're hiding in that noise there. Um, on the host side, this is where you know, you're a little closer to maybe the malware that's doing it. And so if you have static and dynamic analysis, you might see the functions or the um, features in that malware sample that are you know, loading images up. Um, maybe if it, they're using a Python library, they're using a library like Pill. Um, and so if you saw malware that was using those image libraries, it might lead you to say, hey, are they hiding data in there? Um, account for the limits of network monitoring. Again, this is a good way because um, if you can't see it, if your network, um, if your tap point's just too loud or you don't, you, that encryption's in the way, you might be able to do it on host. Um, same deal from the operating system resources. You might be able to do something like, hey, let me look at the process tree. Let me look, um, whether it be memory or disk artifacts, um, to look both for the hiding of data, but also, hey, why is this, um, you know, why is this suspicious binary writing these pictures out to this site? Um, Prevention-wise, finally strengthening your boundaries where possible. Um, and with some of this too, if you can put proxies or file manipulation in the way that can help. Um, one of the kind of interesting ways I've heard to defend against this is something as easy as, hey, if we just slightly change the picture, then they might not be able to um, reconstruct what that hidden file is inside of it. These are just a few ideas that you can use to add it to your threat hunting or detection approach. Um, if you have any other ones, you know, we'd love to hear them or we'd love to um, kind of talk through them. But these were ones that really immediately came to mind with us. Um, so thanks for listening today. Again, the point of our Tech Talk Tuesday talks are really to talk to, to take some of these uh, tactics and techniques, some of the minor ones, and really try to show why it matters and then why what we can do about it. Um, if you do have future ideas, please let us know. We're open to suggestions, um, and we'd really appreciate if you also shared this. Um, that would be great. Thanks a lot, and thanks for listening, and uh, yeah, good luck.